I'm your host, Peter Bergeronov. You can find me on Twitter at Russian98. You can find the full show at Jablam Sports. If you have any questions or comments, please tweet us. Use the hashtag Jablam Sports. That's J A B L A M Sports. Please follow us and subscribe to us on your podcasting app, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of the podcatchers out there. And please share our show with three hockey fans you know. Thank you. Remember, check out our website. Go to jablamsports.com. See all our podcasts. We even have game notes for every episode, and that gives you tidbits and links to all things we mentioned on our show. For our podcasts on our website, click on podcasts, and then hockey for this show specifically. We've also got a wrestling show. Check it out, Pro Wrestling Explode. You can check that on any podcasting app out there, or on our website as well. What do we have for this episode? Well, this is an all LA Kings, all draft, all lottery episode we've got for you. Enjoy this one, Kings fans. For guests, today on the show, joining us, we have Dennis Bernstein. He's a sports media executive and, of course, LA Kings sports reporter. He's got plenty of shows out there. We'll let you know more about that soon enough. Jesse Cohen, the official podcast host of the LA Kings, All the Kings Men podcast. You can check that out. That's right on the LA Kings website. And from Dollar Prospects, the LA Kings scout, Julian Mongilo. Time for some trending now, and of course, joining me on trending now is my pal Logan. How you doing, Logan? Good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm really busy. This episode's gonna be jam packed. <laughs> um, it's Canada Day. Are you enjoying your Canada Day as we record this? Uh, I mean, yeah, I always enjoy my Canada Day. I have some cold beer in the fridge. I'm gonna crack open later. Uh, but I was actually just cleaning the apartment, so <laughs> not much of a celebration. We have to do our cleaning and our chores before we enjoy this really beautiful weather we've been having. It's over 30 it nice degree out. temps. I hope everybody out there is wearing a mask, though, if they're getting into busy areas to enjoy the fireworks or the festivities or being with family and friends. I know we've Beat this to a dead horse with all the different trending topics. And in this episode, of course, we'll go all in on the lottery and the LA Kings. So what has been trending on Twitter is from uh, at Peter Burns ESPN. He tweeted, what's your favorite random sports stat that blows your mind every time you see it? I was thinking about twisting that on the head and saying, what stats or records do we know in the NHL? that we feel might not be broken um, out there. And I'll quickly go through a few of them is of course, Gretzky's like he's on top of almost all of these, <laughs> of course, uh, his 2,853 career points, Bill Mosenko's three goals in 21 seconds. The Habs of course are above and beyond everybody, but hopefully that'll be ca- caught up in the future, but they've got 24 mm-hmm. cups Gretzky, of course, had the 215 points in a season. The list goes on. Sittler, of course, 10 points in a game. Schultz is 400. Sittler's come. Yeah. So people have come close to tying slash breaking Sittler's recently. Gagne did. It was close a couple years ago. I thought someone else was as close as him last year or something like that. But I think yeah. who? Yeah, it was like seven or eight points, right? So yeah. Schultz is 472 penalty minutes in a season. Coffee, 48 goals by defenseman. That's going to be pretty tough. good. That's tough to beat. And, of course, Tiger Williams with almost 4,000 penalty minutes career-wise. That's crazy. Uh, wh- which one were you th- thinking about that's going to be tough to uh, beat, Logan? Uh, the Gretzky's 50 goals in 39 games. That, like, just in itself is going to be, yeah, to get 50 in half a season, 41 games is going to be hard, let alone 39. That's just something I don't see ever happening again. Unless they do something drastic with net sizes and goaltender equipment and everything. Yeah, that's yeah, be... they'd have, they got to double the cage and half the goalie equipment. Like, 
That would be really ridiculous. Gretzky was fantastic, holding so many different records in the NHL. And I'm glad yeah. to see Gretzky kind of come out whenever somebody's even close to beating him. I know with Ovechkin maybe getting close to quite possibly catching him in terms of goal totals, uh, Gretzky was kind of out, out there talking about Ovi and how he hopes that Ovi can beat him. Yeah, I kind of like that too. Like Gretzky will be the first to tell you that his records are meant to be broken. He didn't set them to for to be etched in stone. They, he the comp, he loves the competition. Even if he's not playing, he was he's hoping that he can go along with Ovi and the Cats on that journey too. If they if they ever get close, he wants to be there, just drinking away with Ovi the entire time, probably. But. <laughs> and that's kind of the struggle that I'm having with not watching hockey is. Some of the guys like Austin Matthews would have had a beautiful career year this year and many other players. And Ovi kind of obviously getting less games in the regular season this past season and very possibly much less games whenever the next season will start. Yeah, it's kind of – there was a, already a push of like, well, could he or couldn't he? It was, it was already going to be tough before. It's going to be even tougher now. I do hope that we get to see a lot of people beat a lot of Gretzky's records, and I hope I really yeah. would love to see Ovi celebrate at the end of his career beating Gretzky's goal totals, and by the end of his career, so that would be great to see. And coming up next on this episode, we have Dennis Bernstein. He's a talent acquisition and sports media executive, and of course, his podcast at the Kings Pod is a great one and he of course has his show on the hot stove on Sirius XM so enjoy this interview with him we talk about what he's been going through with everything and how he feels and where he who he thinks the Kings will be drafting with that second overall pick Now to chat with me is Dennis Bernstein. He's a talent acquisition and media, sports media executive. So basically, after we're done recording this, he's going to just hire me for all his shows out there. Right, Dennis? You got it, Pete. No problem. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Uh, so you are a, a talent acquisition specialist with Red Bull. You have on-air work with Sirius with your show there your writer for the fourth period you're covering right. LA Kings and that's what we're going to be talking about today great Dennis welcome to the show Peter thank you for having me on I appreciate it great being I'm great talking hockey and business with you perfect you can reach Dennis on Twitter at Dennis TFP of course your podcast is at Kings of the Pod your website, again, as I've already mentioned it, thefourthperiod.com. And your show, The Hot Stove on Sirius XM. What time is your show yeah. on? Like when? It airs 11 to 1 on Saturdays, every Saturday, Eastern time. So if you're here in L.A., it would be 8 to 10. That's when I get up at 8 a.m. on Saturdays. But it, and it's replayed numerous times uh on saturday so if you don't miss the if you miss it live from 1 to 11 to 1 eastern you can pick it up i think three or four times uh that day as well every i think it's like a two-hour rotation so we probably air at 11 a.m one three five and seven i believe so oh great and yep. it's on what station specifically uh, yeah, Channel 91 NHL uh, Network Radio. Cool, the NHL Network. Perfect. Yeah, I'm I'm hooked up to that. I listen to your show sometimes. I still listen to Coolius, I believe. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on once a week with Cool and, uh, and uh, Mick Kern. We do the uh, discussion room, so we do a little bit of roundtable discussion, uh, usually every Wednesday. They're on, they're on holiday for the next couple of weeks as we hopefully, uh, as hockey comes back, but I'm usually on during the week as well. All right, before we get into all LA King stuff, I like to take people a little bit into the glimpse of our industry. How did sure. we get started? So let people know how you got started as an insider and hockey reporter. About 22 years ago, I wanted to get into hockey games for free. And the only way you do that is to be in the media. So I started the media company. It's basically as simple as that. I did this little fan newsletter for the New Jersey Devils back in the late 90s when they were winning cups. And, uh, you know, 
the, the, the uh, team didn't really like it. They tried to kind of shut me down. And the last thing you should tell me is I can't do something. So that gave me just uh, a little bit more vigor to do that. So I was doing this a uh, little uh, fan newsletter. And then this was really at the beginning of the internet, right? I mean, we're talking late 90s. Uh, I found a website called In the Crease who uh, was looking for writers. I gave them my, uh, the work that I had done, my body of work. And they said, yeah, we really like it. They gave me my own column. And uh, from there, I just really just kind of built my, my body of work, to be honest with you. I kept writing, writing. And then in 2000, ESPN Radio was starting their own um, network, right? And one of the producers was doing some research on the web and found my column and said, would you like to come on and talk hockey? I had already moved to Los Angeles. And I came on and basically I talked to this guy, Joe D'Ambrosio, who I knew from Connecticut. He does the uh, University of Connecticut Husky games. And it was like me and you talking. It's like, you know, just talking to guys, talking hockey. And and the producers liked it. And they said, can you come back on tomorrow? This was on a Saturday. Yeah. What I didn't know, Pete, was that, you know, this is the beginning of yeah, network radio. So uh, because it was weekends, most of the local stations didn't have local hosts. So they were pumping an ESPN radio. I was on 300 stations nationally, you know, nationally in the U.S. So I started getting pings from all these different cities like Las Vegas and San Diego. And it just kind of built from there. And here you're on my show, the little small show in Toronto. Exactly. Absolutely. I love, I do all the shows, man. I'm happy to help everybody. Perfect. Thank you, Dennis. And sure. with everything going on, of course, you are in L.A. How is mm. everything and the situation going on there with the pandemic? Well, I'm fine. My family's fine. I don't know anybody that has contracted COVID-19. Now, you got to understand, Pete, the numbers are, are, are trending up and it's not a good thing, but... Yeah. There are 10.4 million people in Los Angeles, so the, the large majority of us don't have it. And I'm, you know, I'm a little bit more of a higher risk. I'm over 60, but I'm healthy. My immune system's healthy. I work out every day. I do about nine miles on my. So, uh, but I will go out and I'm, I'll wear a mask out of respect to people. I mean, I'm not sick, so I can't make anybody sick. I have been tested. I don't have any antibody, so I'm fine there. So it's look, it's it's a difficult time for everybody, and hopefully, everybody will wake up. And just the last couple of weeks. What happened is everybody got lax in the U.S., and that's why you're seeing, you know, two hub studies being Edmonton and, and Toronto. So um, yeah. we're doing the best we can. We're going to adhere to all the uh, the announcements. So at some point, Pete, we got to move on. We got to live our lives again. There's some good news about vaccines today from Pfizer, but um, I, I'm more optimistic than most. Um, I will be careful out there, but I believe we'll get through this. And there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and we'll have hockey at the end of July, and then hopefully people in the buildings by the end of the year. Uh, you mentioned before, and I was emailing back and forth with you, you've really been a little bit busy with this time. So how? tell us more about your racehorses. Oh, yeah. I, I bought them. <laughs> there was nothing much to do. And, and I, because there's no sports on TV, Pete, yeah. I, I was watching. I watch in the mornings. I get up either on Saturday, either watch – uh, Premier League Soccer, which my wife can't stand, mm -hmm. or TVG, which is the horse racing network. So you know, we were just talking and saying, you know, it doesn't cost a lot to buy a horse. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe a claim of 3500 And then, of course, she does her research. And she comes back to me. She goes, it costs $65,000 to buy a horse. <laughs> I'm like, no, it doesn't. So there's this syndicate called MyRich.com that, that sells shares of horses. So basically I said, okay, let me, so I bought into uh, a group of four fillies. Also bought this week of two more, uh, a Colt and actually Authentico, I believe ran in the Belmont Stakes. You might run the Kentucky Derby. It's a very small share, but you know, I'm backing all my bets, Pete. If we don't play hockey, I need something to do during the summer. So if one of my horses run at Del Mar, I'll be going down there and hanging out. So, uh, so that's it. It's a nice little distraction because we've had no sport, Pete. It's been, yeah. for guys like you and me, it's been really, really tough. You can't watch the news because it's so depressing. Um, I do watch the stock market. And though I know a lot of sports gamblers are day traders now, mm -hmm. but I'm not into that. So it just uh, hopefully will buy the time and just a little bit more entertainment. And um, so that's why I decided to go that route. Yeah. I, I, me, myself, previously working at like Woodbine Racetrack over here at the beginning yeah, of my sure. career, I, I did the Pepsi North American Cup and, of course, the big Queen's Plate. And that was a blast always every year. We get yeah. a lot of different uh, networks coming in to do that, uh, but yes, the, they would run those horses through thick and thin, no matter yeah. what. So they're shut down too right now. So that's how yeah. maybe tough we're oh, no, go Woodbine's going. Woodbine's open through. now. Yeah, Woodbine's open, but no, I don't think for people. But yeah, there's the tracks around the U.S. are open, running. Mm -hmm. Santa Anita's open. Uh, Los Alamitos is open. So 
you know, they let people in the building and down when they race in Del Mar in San Diego, yeah. you know, I'd go down and check it out. Although hopefully I'll be covering hockey by the time we get to August. <laughs> I hope we do. All right. Yeah. Let's get to some hockey. Did you watch the draft lottery live? Of course. Yeah. And the best part of it was the look on Bill Daly's face when he turned over that placeholder card. That was right. <laughs> But yeah, but Pete, look, I know Peter will criticize this, yeah. but look, here's the deal. Like, it was there was drama, number one. Number two, there's going to be drama again when the eight teams lose in the first round mm-hmm. and they have another draft lottery. That's going to be great. So, like, people, look, Pete, there's a lot of negative people right out there that, that keep saying cancel the season and that was a disaster and stuff like that. It wasn't a disaster. Mm-hmm. No, look, you, you have to understand, Pete, you have to wait until you figure out who actually gets the pick. Because I'll submit to you that if Montreal, who's the 24th best team in the, in the league this year, gets a, a French-Canadian star to play at the Bell Center next season, like that's a good thing for the league, right? If it's Pittsburgh, I get it. If it's Edmonton because they have Leon and Connor, I get it. But it's not over yet. If it's Winnipeg, they, that that's a team that probably deserves it. And they would have had a chance. Like Montreal, if we went to the old format, it would have been 16 teams, they wouldn't have played. So they would have had a legitimate chance too. So – um, I just I, I really don't like the criticism when I see all the work the league and the PA is doing to try to get this game back on the ice. Mm. I have no fault. And I've used this term a lot um, over the last two months. We're landing on the best of bad ideas. It's not perfect. But if you want perfect in this world right now, you're on the wrong planet. So you have to really be adaptable. Next season will be no, more normal. But I thought it was really entertaining. And from a company L.A. perspective, I'm saying, OK, well, oh, they moved up. I'm like. Oh shit! They're the number three. Wait, they can win it. So, and to get the second overall is a really great thing for Los Angeles. So, I, I liked it. I liked the drama. I just thought that the, the most salient point of the whole thing was Bill. The look on Bill Daly's face when he turned over the placeholder card. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious how some people thought it was like conspiracy theories. I thought, oh, well, gee, oh, you know, oh, I'm like, I'm, I was thinking, seriously, how do they? How would they think that? Did they really think this is kind of what the NHL wanted? I guess maybe no. to build more suspense in a second kind of show. I don't know. How could you say it's it's fixed if you don't even know the team that won yet? Yeah. I think some people misunderstood people that thought that like that placeholder E card was a team had won it. But if you have the eight teams to the same odds, how's it you have to fix it twice? Yeah. Fixed it this time and then fixed it the next time to get the team you want. I mean, come on. If you're going to be that big of a conspiracy theorist, you know, <laughs> I, I don't have anything for you. All right. Was it just me or were Blake and Lucky Luke, their reactions just priceless during the show? Oh, yeah. yeah they were like kind of stunned. <laughs> They're like, oh, wait, we actually good luck finally. Because, you know, they've never they, – they've won the lottery back in the day, but it's when you can only move like three spots. So mm-hmm. I think they went from – one year from seven to four, they've never had the first overall pick. So I think they were kind of stunned that because, you know, they would figure what's going to happen. Where are they going to be at four, which is what the standing was, or they'd move down, right? They never have good luck there. So to be sitting there in the room saying that they could have got first overall pick. Yeah, I think they were kind of stunned that they were good luck, to be honest with you. Totally, totally. I read your blog, and I'm going to post mm-hmm. it on my episode page for this show. Great. It does seem like you feel the Kings might draft – a uh, byfield over Stoltz uh, for that with that second overall pick. Yeah, I think so. Because look, th- that's the guy who would be Kopitar's, you know, successor, mm-hmm. right? Um, he's seven. He's the youngest player. He's seventeen years old. But I think that they're going to go that route because they have. If he truly is the number two behind, it. and look, the comparables are depends where you read and depends where I, I've heard three players. Um, Kopitar, it'd be nice to have a second. And I text Kopitar in, in Slovenia after mm-hmm. it was over. He goes, yeah, I'd like to have another Kopi on the team. So he, he'd certainly be happy with that. Malkin, which, you know, a big, you know, guy who can score. And the other guy that I just recently heard was a younger Eric Stahl. Okay. Like, you, you draft that that player. Stolci is absolutely dynamic. Um, and the other thing, Pete, is like, over the summer, like, these guys are going to be drafted in October. If Stolci grew a, an inch and a half, and gained 15 pounds over the summer. Well, didn't you look at it? And we, uh, I believe they were going to interested in Kirby Doc. And if they had got to three, they probably would have drafted Goff. And Doc's in that same nut, right? He's 6'4". Speed and skill is, is really paramount these days. And it's changed since doing the cup. The Kings won the cup. I do think they'll go with Byfield. And that gives them the, the flexibility because they'll have so many different players who can play center. You know, Gabe Velarde played center last season. Alex Turcotte's a center, right? Can they move those guys to the wing? Because this team still needs offense, right? And if they get Byfield and Stutzley, they're both great offensive players. 
Um, I can't just say that traditional big side by, because again, I think he could certainly be mentored by Kopitar and eventually succeed Andre. Andre is still in his prime, even though he's 32. I think he's got at least three, four more years uh, to go. And so I think we've got another four, three, four months for them to decide. And that's the one luxury they have. But I think at this point in time, if I had to handicap it, I would say that Byfield would be their preference at this point. Yep. It, it seems like that's kind of what a lot of people are thinking. With yeah. the Kings, they've really developed, and you've mentioned a few guys like Velarde and stuff, but they've really developed their po- prospect pool the last year, few years. I think they're considered number one among all the teams in the NHL. Who do you feel yeah. is ready among those prospects to take the step maybe in the next season for the Kings? Yeah, well, Gabe had a great start, right? He scored in his first shot in the NHL, Velarde. Mm-hmm. So can, can he continue that that 10-game st- standpoint? I think Alex Turcotte's going to be ready next year, a really talented kid who played at Wisconsin for you with Cole Caulfield. He could step up. The, the one kind of uh, wild card is Al, uh, uh, Arthur Kaliev, who's lit up the OHL scoring. Now, the, the, the issue with Arthur is he can either go back to the O or be in the NHL. And he can't, the age consideration, he can't go to the A next year. Right. So that's it. So he's either, and what, it doesn't make much sense. He's dominated that league from a goal scoring standpoint. He's a dynamic shooter, great shot, one, shot first mentality, something they really don't have. So could he be there next season? Yes. I think Tyler Madden's probably a couple seasons away because he's slight, but he's a legitimate prospect. And I have people from Vancouver saying, wow, I can't believe you got Tyler Madden and the title of the Foley trade. So I think those are the guys up front that were right through. Rasmus Kapari had a knee injury last season, so he could be there on the blue line. You've got Mikey Anderson, who came up the Atlanta season, a really mature kid with a great head on his shoulders. He played well. Uh, uh, Toby Bjornfoot uh, had a little bit of a trial, maybe eight games going in the beginning of the season, went back to the AHL. Clegg is a guy who they've been looking for to add, add some offense. So so they've got – the great thing about the Kings is that they, they, they have depth at all the different levels. They have depth on the forward line. They have depth on the blue line. And they have depth at goal. Uh, the Parrot kid that they uh, drafted from the Czech Republic um, is th- in the third round is a really good player. So they have a level. What they didn't have, and why this draft was so important, they didn't have that ground tool, that one truly elite player. Like yeah. I, I, Gabe Lloyd might be elite, took out might be elite, but if it's either Byfield or Stutzley, that's the guy who's going to be elite. And to put that at the top of the ranking, which you, I agree with you, most if not if they're not the second best, they're the best group of prospects in the league right now. Two seasons from now, this team should be back in the playoffs. Next season is a time for them to analyze all these guys because they have so many prospects. And we even talked about the other issue is that they've got three second-round picks. They're going to have a point in time where they're going to have too many prospects, and they can't evaluate them all. So next season, people ask them in the offseason what they maybe go for at all. Take this entire grouping of prospects and figure out where they fit on the, on the depth chart. How do they integrate them in the system? You know, where do they fit? You know, and then at that point, you'll see them probably use some of the extra prospects because they can also have three. They may have three picks in 2021 as well in the second round. They may use those picks and prospects to trade for an established player, maybe a 26 or 27-year-old guy that can help them offensively. And they don't have any cap issues as well. Even with the way the CB is going to come in with a flat cap, they're going to have a lot of space. They're going to lose about ten thousand or ten million dollars in cap space um, the following season because Kovalchuk and um, Finuff's uh, hits are going to come off the books. They're going to be in really good shape for the twenty one twenty two season, Peter. That that's probably going to be good because with that flat cap, that will be yeah. much needed, and a lot of teams might be really in the in the struggle or the bubble for them. It's going to be tough, and to have and say, look, they have two million, two ten million dollar players in Kopitar and that, but all these kids coming in are going to be only entry level deals. It's mm-hmm. going to give them so much cushion. They're going to lose those two capits for the buyouts. They're going to be in really good shape to make some moves, and they may be able to vulture in on a team that has cap issues and get a really good player. But it won't happen next season. But the following season, I would suspect that they would be in the in the in a battle. Just going into maybe next season, how do you think? this team will look how many of these kids do you think are going to be brought up to play you don't want to rush any of these kids mm-hmm. right i think if they draft byfield he may not even, he may go back to junior, he may not even get a sniff maybe you give him the nine game sniff or whatever he'll have an opportunity to make the team but i, I think there's enough depth there that if gabe velarde is going to be your second line center next year that's fine like again this is an evaluation period so i don't think a ton of i think that mikey anderson will get a full run 
Um, they've already established that Matt Roy, you know, it's funny. Matt Roy was voted the best defenseman by the LA media this year, not Drew Doughty. So, mm-hmm. so Sean Walker made a breakthrough. So they don't have to have six players make uh, six rookies make the team. You wouldn't want that anyway. I think players will get tastes, but then what they'll do is they'll develop them down in uh, in Ontario. And the key there is they let Mike Stuthers go. So they have to find a coach who's a developmental coach who can work with youngsters and things of that nature. So maybe maybe one or two breakthrough to the lineup next year. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to evaluate where Kaliev would fit. Where does Turcock fit? Is he a center? Is he going to play the wing? Right. Is Kapari going to play the center wing? They, they have the flexibility. A guy like Akil Thomas, who did great things for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the junior team. Um, where does he fit in the mix as well? So they're going to have to make some decisions here. Um, so it's a, an embarrassment of riches at this point in time. When you look ahead, potentially you could have guys, fight, guys who are on the team this, this year are be fighting for jobs is what you want. With respect to results, I, I think you're looking at it, had they completed the season, they probably would have had about 72, 74 points. They'll probably make a, a ten-point jump. They, they'll probably play around five hundred hockey because, again, this is going to be a very young team with some still some gaps. They had the right coach in in um, in Tom McCollum, so I think that's a huge plus. Um, so I think this is a situation where if they can be playing games of importance in March, I think they'll be happy. It doesn't mean they're going to be in a wild card position, but if they're playing, if they're not out of the mix like they were at the beginning, at midway through this season, I think that's a win for this team. And then, But then I expect that they should be contending in the following season. So this is basically the coming season of the Kings is a season of discovery. Where do all these prospects that we've heard about, where do they fit on the depth chart? And then Rob can pivot off that next offseason. All right. All right. Th- thanks. This was great talking to you uh, about the Kings and their prospects and everything, Dennis. Uh, before we leave you, uh, you did mention to me uh, that you drank out of the cup, and before we get yeah. to how bad that tasted, when did you uh, get to taste the cup? Was it during one of the runs, 2012, yeah. 2014? It was. It was. It was the end, 2014. Yeah. Um, I, I am close with both Kopitar and Brown on the team. Brown invited me up for his weekend with the cup. Um, he was gracious enough. Him and his wife, I'm very close to them. And when he was going through all those trials and tribulations with Daryl Sutter uh, mm-hmm. in 2012 about the potential. You know, trade rumors they kind of reached out to me and i kind of gave them some inside info so they invited me up to um their home in ithaca new york um they rented a boat on a friday evening and the cup rolled up and there was probably about 30 bottles of beer that was <laughs> that was emptied to the top and uh he and his buddy tipped it over and i i drank out of it so uh, i did not raise it over my head because that's uh you can't do that. You only if you play. But yeah, but I was able to do that. Go to one of the parties and taste it. And it there was a lot of foam, Pete, in the beer, yeah. right? Because there was. But it was. Uh, I, I have actually. We, they had a photographer on site, so actually in my office, I do have a picture of me drinking out of the cup. Great. That's that's a great story. All yeah. right, Dennis. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh. You can reach Dennis on Twitter at Dennis TFP. Again, your podcast at Kings of the Pod website thefourthperiod.com, and, of course, your show on Sirius XM, The Hot Stove. Dennis, thank you for coming on the show. Peter, it was great talking to you. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Talking to Dennis a few days ago was really an eye-opener for me. You can see he really does work hard and how professional he truly is. I'm glad he can make time for our show, and I can hope we can have him back in the future. Next up, we have Jesse Cohen. He's been on the show in the past with his podcast, All the King's Men, now in its sixth season for the LA Kings. Now to chat, we have Jesse Cohen. He's the host of the official LA Kings podcast, The All The Kings Men. You can find it wherever you find podcasts, Apple, Spotify, and of course, right on the LA Kings website, you click on navigation, click on fans, I believe, and you'll see all the different podcasts you guys have. You guys have a lot of podcasts with LA there, eh? Yeah, quickest way to get there is just uh, lakings.com slash podcast. 
you don't have to worry about navigating through all that. We've got our own landing page. But yeah, we've got the Fox and Faust podcast, which has wrapped up its first season. That's with our broadcasters, yep. Alex Faust and Jim Fox. We've got the Rainy Day podcast with uh, Zach Dooley and Cameron Close. They cover our minor league affiliate out in Ontario, Ontario, California, not mm-hmm. Ontario, Canada. Yeah. And uh, as you said, all the Kings men, which uh, covers the Kings. And you can reach him on Twitter at Kings Men Podcast. Jesse, welcome back to the show. Thanks. And before we get some hockey talk, really, you hate White Claw that much? I know it's a big fad. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm not for fads. I've never been that type of guy. I remember even like back in the day uh-huh. when uh, there was like what's it called the ER ER show. I remember I wa- I watched the first season, then it became popular. And I'm like I'm not gonna watch it anymore. I'm not watching Game of Thrones. I still haven't seen one episode today, and all of those other big shows. I'm not the fad type dude. Uh, when I'm doing my drinking per se i'll get my wintergreen uh dip and some you know steam whistle from downtown toronto and i'll have maybe a drinking night but what do you, how are you with the white claw and you you just don't like well, it at first all? Of all I, f- I feel i feel like er was on for like 20 years yeah, <laughs> that counts it as was bad and seriously <laughs> i only saw the first season and then it became popular i guess after the first season i'm like yeah, yeah it's not, it's not for me anymore <laughs> <laughs> no, so the white the white claw thing. Uh, look, part of this is probably just that I'm in my early 40s, and yeah. it's a, you know drinking is a young man's game. Um, but no, I I have a couple friends who they love. Uh, look, I'm probably going to say this wrong, but Lacroix, Lacroix, whatever the, the yeah. sparkling water is. And everybody at work loves the sparkling water, and I've never been a huge sparkling water fan. But a few months ago, I finally broke down and was like, well, all right, everybody's talking about this. Maybe I'll try it. It's not great. It's 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 really mild hint of flavor with sparkling water, and I just don't care. I think it's more about I don't I don't even know. Whatever. It's it's a, <laughs> it's about the ability to have the conversation about the brand. Like it's almost yeah. like you know it's it's this sort of quasi irony that gets popular where it's like oh Lacroix it's available for whatever forty nine cents a can so it's a joke that we like it but now we do like it. So then White Claw came around, and um, you know I've got a couple of buddies that I play uh, on Xbox with regularly. You know we get on when their kids have gone to sleep and all of our work is done, and it's you know ten thirty at night or whatever. And occasionally, um, one of them will have a drink, and occasionally it's a White Claw. And then the conversation that I was familiar hearing about Lacroix, you know what flavor do you get? You know is it any good? Sort of moved over to White Claw, so I finally tried it and i went to my local grocery store and they only had one single Mm. can it wasn't in a (laughs) a six bag or anything so i bought it and uh yeah i'm not impressed it's not good it's not terrible it's not awful i didn't spit it out and vow never to do it again but the conversation it seems to me has way more to do with the the name Mm -hmm. and the packaging and just the sort of like I said, that weird quasi irony that I've never understood of like, it's it's White Claw, which is a a bizarre name on top of it, like just by itself. Yeah. And then so you've got a bunch of guys in my case, you know, who are upper middle class at worst, yeah. right? Married with kids and mortgages and nice cars, and they're drinking White Claw. Uh, and like I said, it's this weird i you know it's the same thing that made paps blue ribbon popular when i was in my 20s where it was like okay nobody actually drinks paps blue ribbon but you find yourself going to a dive bar in the middle of downtown long beach which is where i lived at the time you know and it's a it's the last place on earth you'd expect paps blue ribbon to show up but suddenly all of us are drinking pbrs because the local bar had a hey it's two dollar pbr wednesday and you're going there and you're like look at us, it's hysterical that we're drinking PBR. That, Mm. to me, is the success of White Claw. And like I said, maybe it's just that I'm 42, but I don't don't need it. (laughs) How are you dealing with everything going on in the world right now with the pandemic and in terms of uh, in L.A. right now? I mean, it's it's rough out here. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have hockey. We haven't had hockey since March. And I'm the kind of person who... I'm not going to say my entire life revolves around hockey, but, you know, for years, hockey was a hobby and it was, you know, something to do on the side. And now that it's my profession, you know, you find that your professional life, your social life and your entertainment life have sort of blended into one thing. 
So to have hockey taken away from you. And then on top of that, you know, you're being asked not to go out, not to mingle, not to do some of the things that you would ordinarily do. It's, it's, it's rough, but you know, all things considered, I do live in Southern California. So the weather's nice and I'm fortunate enough to still have my job. So I'm trying not to complain too much because I know how difficult uh, other people are having it. Uh, let's get to some hockey talk then. Let's do it. Uh, how tight are you with Bailey? He seems like a cool cat. Pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty close. Yeah, yeah. I spend a lot of time talking to Bailey. Uh, get, on any given week, we do the uh, Bailey's movie night Monday nights, where we uh, encourage fans to watch a movie, and then we speak to a star from that movie. We've done, oh, I don't know how many now, but at mm-hmm. least feels like a dozen maybe maybe it's less than that but we've done a few quite a few and we're going to continue to do some and then uh he and i have teamed up on some other uh content and we're continuing to, to plan stuff out so yeah i uh talk to bailey or, or growl at bailey whatever you want to call it <laughs> but yeah he and i uh he, we're, we're close i would say and i know that you guys have been pretty busy too with a bit of the social media stuff and and even talking about like old games slash uh games like simulations type stuff on on twitch and stuff as well yeah so bailey started sim when the season got canceled Mm -hmm. uh, back in march bailey immediately started simulating the games that would have been played on the days they were scheduled to be played and we we did that we toyed around with with simulating a fake playoffs but uh the decision was made not to do that (laughs) um which was disappointing i think i i wanted to do it but whatever (laughs) um and then we did a simulation, you know, what would happen if the 2012 LA Kings played the 2014 LA Kings mm-hmm. and Bob Miller, uh, former play-by-play announcer for the Kings came back uh, to help Alex and Jim with that one. We've got a couple more ideas for simulated games moving forward. We're not entirely sure which direction the organization wants us to go, but we've got a couple different strategies Um plotted out so we're definitely going to be doing more simulated games and there'll be more there'll be more movie nights and then maybe one or two other uh content ideas involving bailey but we also have all the king's men live which is every thursday at noon which is me and carlin bathe our sideline reporter from fox sports west um where we've interviewed you know, we had Mark Yanetti, director of scouting, on last yeah. week. We've had Nelson Emerson. We've had uh, players, Velarde, uh, Drew Doughty, Trevor Lewis, uh, uh, Matt Valalta, Alex Iafalo, um, a number of people from the organization. And we're going to start trying to broaden our horizons and, and bring more people in from outside of the organization now that the draft lottery has happened. So, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff coming, and, and we hope that fans enjoy it. Sweet. That sounds great. I actually did – a playoff simulation on Twitch. It took me two months, and I did it. It's all, <laughs> it's all on my website, jablamsports.com. If you click on simulation, I'm still doing the NBA one. Uh, I struggled with that one a little bit just because i not as versed mm-hmm. with uh, the <laughs> NBA players because during the N- NHL one, I would actually talk a little bit in between intermissions gotcha. uh, where the NBA one was like, yeah, Giannis was pretty good that game. That's it. That's all I have to say. Uh, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, on the website, uh, it was a close battle, and you go, you can go on there and find out who won in the finals between the Oilers and the Flyers. Crazy. Wow. Um, no winner in that matchup. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. You know, Carter Hart's been playing well this year, so we'll see what happens <laughs> with those guys if they can have a good run. Uh, I did listen to your previous episode with uh, Mark Mark Yanetti and. Uh, mm-hmm. Luke Robitaille. That was a great episode. I like the insight with the lottery night and everything with that and what they might do with the second overall selection. You watched the draft lottery live, right? Was I did, just, yeah. Was it just me or Blakey, Blake and uh, Lucky Luke? Their reactions were hilarious. Yeah, they were a little <laughs> bit more muted than I would have expected. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could just see them, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but uh, yeah, a low, I would have ex- – I mean, I was um, – so I've told this story already before, but uh, we were on a Zoom call, the King's offices, right? They, I don't know how many of us were on the call, but it was a, a lot, a lot of people. Yeah. And the idea was that if we got the number one overall pick, we'd all be recording ourselves so that then our production team could put together a video of everybody reacting 
mm. to the reveal that it was a number one overall pick. Now, I did not turn my camera on and my microphone on uh -huh. um, because I didn't, I don't want anybody seeing what I would do uh, <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if we got the first pick. And I didn't want anybody seeing any of it. You know, as soon as they turned over the seventh card, which was the lowest the Kings could pick, mm. and it wasn't the Kings, you know, I started clapping and I stood up out of my chair and, you know, started screaming at the TV and, and every card that got turned over subsequently, I would do the same thing. And I, like I said, I'm just not interested in people seeing me act like a lunatic. Mm. Um, I've had people invite me over for playoff games in the past. And I've said to them, you know, I will come, <laughs> but you have to understand that there are rules that I will insist are followed. Yeah. And they always think I'm joking. And as soon as I get there, they start trying to break the rules. And I start saying, no, no. <laughs> I told you very clearly, yeah. this is not going to be fun for you. I'm not a normal human being. Um, no pausing, no going to the kitchen to see, you know, to make the pizza and coming back so that we can skip through the commercials. Like none of that. Mm -hmm. No talking to me during play. Like <laughs> if I get mad, you can't tell me it's just a game. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I didn't. Uh, so, yeah, so Robitaille and, and Blake, like I said, were they didn't jump out of their chairs and do a little dance and get excited and you know it's probably good for them that they didn't. But uh, yeah, but yeah, I was sort of surprised at how calm. It was. I guess everybody kind of has to hold it back, and I know we do sometimes when we're in the media and when we're at games. You know, you just like you gotta you like it, but you can't show too much emotion. And then when you get home, you can have your hissy fit or your party. Yeah, <laughs> you know it's funny. There's you know there's the rule no cheering in the press box. Yeah, um, and I've said this a number of times too. But I've I've figured out how to stop the reaction of cheering for a goal, mm -hmm. but I still haven't figured out how not to clap when there's a good penalty kill. Ah, uh. so I'll be up in the press box and a goal will happen and I'll do a little like uh, you know nobody can see me but you but yeah. I'm doing a quiet fist bump. Yeah, but if they clear the zone on a penalty kill and it's a big penalty kill, I'm still. You know, still mm. cla I'm still clapping. I don't know how to shut that part of my brain off. So, <laughs> All right. With that second overall pick, who do you feel with everything that you've done so far and the research and talking to some guys, who do you feel they might be leaning towards in terms of that using that pick on? I can honestly say I have no idea. Mm. I have heard compelling arguments for both Quentin Byfield and Tim uh, Stutzla. I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. Like the the conclusion that I've come to is it really shouldn't matter because the rest of the guys have to be great anyway. You know, Velarde, Turcotte, Madden, Kupari, Hultz, Anderson, Bjornfoot, Fagamo, Kaliev, all those guys have to be great. And if all of those guys are 80% of their ceiling, then it won't matter if you wind up taking the quote unquote wrong guy between Byfield and Stutzla or Raymond or whoever else you want to include in the rankings, yeah. because you'll have such a solid team surrounding them. And then the flip side of that is also true. If all of those guys are 30% of what you want them to be right. If they're all misses, if Bjorn foot can't play, if Turcotte is a third line center, if Madden is a fourth line center, if Kaliev you know, of all of the terrible stories about his work ethic not being there are true. You know what I mean? If all these guys are bums, yeah. then it doesn't matter how good Stutzla or Byfield are. You know, you see Eichel out in Buffalo or even Connor McDavid in Edmonton until they got some other players around him. Like one guy's not enough to do it. Yeah. And you need, you need it. To, I mean, it's cliche and corny to say, but you need a team to be successful. And, you know, I was just saying this to, um, to one of my friends in the media earlier this morning asking about Byfield or, or Stutzla. And I said, you know, if you go back to the 2012 and 2014 Cup wins, it's not as if Andrzej Kopitar, Drew Doughty, Jonathan Quick, Jeff Carter, Dustin Brown, um, you know, all the guys that were there for two Cups. It's not as if they're all the same type of player or the same personality, the same, you know, whether it's aggressive or passive or defensive or offensive or skilled versus, you know, hustle, grit, whatever you want to call it, like, it's still a recipe. It's still a combination of elements. And so, you know, maybe Stutzla has parts of his game that are better than Byfield and maybe Byfield has better parts of his game than Stutzla. But at the end of the day, you still have to find a way to fit them in with the rest of what you have. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know yet what the Kings are, are cooking with. 
when it comes to all of these prospects. So I don't think there's a wrong choice ultimately, but I don't know is the real answer to your question. I have no, <laughs> I have no idea what they're going to do. <laughs> all right. In terms of the rest of the draft, what type of players or needs do you think they're going to be looking for, you know, because in the first round or two, you know, you're just pretty much picking the best available player. But, yeah. you know, when you go further on, you might be looking at, all right, well, we really need some more offensive punch, you know, on in their top, four, you know, six or nine. What do you what do you think they're going to be looking for mostly? So, I mean, you heard it when you listened to the thing with Unetti, right? Yeah. He stressed best best player available. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's easy when you're in the top 10 to say best player available. And, and I saw somebody complain about that phrase and say, well, it doesn't mean anything because, you know, how do you decide two players who are totally different? You know, how do you decide which is better? And I said, okay, well, that's true. But really what best player available means is you don't pick, you know, if you don't have any defensemen with the second overall pick, it it just means you don't take a defenseman if he's the 15th ranked guy just because you need a defenseman. So once you get past that number two pick, I think the Kings pick number 35 in the second round. Mm -hmm. Um, 36 35 or 36 my math is terrible whatever it winds up being um but like i said they have sort of a universally highly rated prospect pool right whether it's the athletic or the hockey writers or tsn or whomever you know the the king's prospect pool is pretty pretty consistently ranked number one yeah. and so like i said i don't i don't know that anybody knows what the Kings need because even Drew Doughty is 29 or 30. If you're talking about a draft now where a guy you take in the second, third, fourth round, maybe he's not even available for three seasons, four seasons, five seasons. Um, You know, Drew Doughty will still be active, but you also have, as I mentioned before, Tobias Bjornfoot, Mikey Anderson, Cole Hultz, guys like Walker and Roy, who are now 25, five years from now, maybe they're 29 or 30. Maybe they've developed and gotten a little bit better. Maybe they, even if they're just as stable as they are today, they're still NHL players. So I think they probably stick to the formula that it looks like they've been following for the past two seasons, which is to get guys with big character upside. You know, like when Dean Lombardi was building the cup winning team 2012, one of the jokes that we would have sort of behind the scenes, we look at each other and we're like, how many of these guys have worn letters for their junior teams or their, or the teams they're coming from, right? Like whether it was Mike Richards um, or, or guys like that. And it's beginning to look a lot like that in the prospect pool, right? Like a lot of the guys they're picking up have either worn letters or are predicted to wear letters or have been named to international teams or all-star teams. Mm -hmm. So my suspicion is that they'll keep going out and getting guys like that. Um, Or, or even in some of the deeper rounds, they went ahead and got somebody. I think this is, uh, I think it was Jordan Spence that they drafted in this fifth round. I think I want to say he's a right-handed shot defenseman for the Moncton Wildcats. And he was like born in Australia but then moved to Japan, then moved to Hawaii, then moved to Canada. Like he's moved all over the place as a kid. He's got this incredible story. And part of the reason they were so high on him was that from their perspective, that was a real sign of his character was that he could handle constantly having his life shift out from underneath his feet at a young age. And he was still able to produce high numbers and, and, and still develop his game despite all of these changes happening around him. Now, I don't know where he ranks in the overall prospect ranking of, of last season, but I mean, like I said, I think it was fifth round. I'm going to look it up. It's going to drive me crazy. But the point is I'm sure you could have made any pick with that pick mm-hmm. and, and found some way of justifying it. And I can tell you that I wouldn't have cared one way or the other, if it was Jordan Spence or whoever was picked immediately following him. Sorry, fourth round 95th overall, you know, <laughs> what do I know about 95th versus 96th ranked guys, Yeah, you know, in the juniors, right? Detroit took Ethan Phillips at 97. New Jersey took Tice Thompson at 96. Honestly, I'd never heard of either one of those guys. The only reason I've heard of Jordan Spence is because the Kings took him. But the point is their justification was this sort of character, this intangible, if you will. So my, my hunch is that they'll keep going for guys like that. In terms of the, uh, many of the prospects. And of course you've already mentioned they are, the Kings are considered, number one 
in terms of their prospect pool in the league. Mm-hmm. Which ones are maybe the Kings the most high on that maybe aren't way up there, like of Velarde or Turcotte? Uh, and then, of course, which ones do you think will come in maybe to the roster whenever next season starts? Uh, I mean, Alex Turcotte is the one that I think they signed him or they were scheduled to sign him. His collegiate year was done. And so he signed, I want to say it was a PTO with the Ontario Reign, or maybe it was even his entry level contract. I don't remember. But he was set to practice with the Reign on March 12th. And that was the day that the season got shut down. It's mm-hmm. so like Alex Turcotte was right on the verge of maybe playing a handful of games for the Kings at the end of the season, or certainly playing a handful of games for the Ontario Reign. So, you know, he's right up at the top of the list now where you go like, oh, well, maybe, maybe he'll crack it. Maybe he'll get a look. But, you know, Anderson played, I want to say six games. Velarde played 10 games. Uh, Clegg played in, I think, four. So, I mean, all of those guys are bubble considerations, I would say, for actually making the team moving forward. Like, everyone talks about Velarde as if he's just on the roster now. But I sort of think, like, well, I don't know. He played 10 games for the Kings at the end of a season where they were missing the playoffs by quite a lot um, for a second season in a row. But, yeah, I think he had seven points in those 10 games. If I'm, Maybe I could be wrong about that. But it was – whatever it was, it was the most – points a player had gotten in the first 10 games since Kopitar had joined the Kings or something mm-hmm. like that. So, I mean, everybody assumes he'll make it, but sleeper guys, um, I don't know. It's hard to pick. I mean, I guess Cole Holtz would be the one he's uh, played uh, for Penn state. He's the uh, big 10 defensive player of the year and the big 10 player of the year. And I don't think before the end of this season, anybody had given him much attention or consideration but I wouldn't be completely stunned if he made the roster this coming season. And like I said, that's a name. I mean, Kings fans are familiar with him, but but that's a name that I would expect that people outside of LA maybe haven't heard of. And, mm-hmm. and he hasn't got as much press as the rest of them, who I think is close to, to cracking the lineup. Before we leave, and as some Leaf fans like myself want to know a little bit more of, how are... Our buddies that we traded away the <laughs> prospects in the Jake Muzzin deal doing. How are Grunstrom and Deruzzi projecting? I, you know what? When I was looking at his numbers, Deruzzi is like even playing even better offensively, even with the rain. So I think he is still progressing really well. Yeah, Derzy's, um through no fault of his own sort of finds himself in a in a glut of defensive mm-hmm. defensemen in Ontario. I think we had nine at one point this season. Like there's just a, there's just too many defensemen. <laughs> um now the Kings traded Alec Martinez and uh Derek Forbert. So that opens up space in LA and Curtis McDermott signed a two year extension. So he'll probably be playing in LA. So there's m- more room now in Ontario. And I think there are some guys, you know, like Paul Ledoux who maybe won't be brought back. I could be wrong. Maybe he will, but is an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year. And I think he's 27, maybe 28. So chances are he won't be coming back. So there's more ice time for Jersey. The fact that he's a right-hand shot um, and he's young and, and does have focus on him because of that trade. I think he'll get a ton of playing time. I think people are pretty happy with his development. Grundstrom is the one that I'm sort of surprised by mm-hmm. because he came in the season that that trade happened. Yeah. And he played, I want to say, 15 games with the Kings after the, the trade. I mean, and that was a season where they were really, really bad. Yeah. And, and he looked good at the beginning. He, I guess. Yeah. he looked real good. And I, yeah. and like I said, I think it was, I'm just going to pull it up real quick. It was 15 games and he scored five goals, mm-hmm. six points, and they were nice. Um, mm-hmm. And then this season he's gotten into 13 games, only four points, which is not that big a step down from the six he had previously. And I mean, that's not terrible numbers. Um, but he only played 40 games uh, in Ontario and, you know, he had 28 points. I mean, like there are games where I saw him in Ontario and he looked great and he looked terrific. And then he'd get called up to the NHL and he sort of, he'd sort of disappear. Or I heard some people saying that he was struggling to adapt to McClellan's uh, defensive scheme. So mm-hmm. who knows if that, you know, that could be, taxing on any player, right? You get traded from one organization to another. And then as soon as you're traded there, 
the interim coach who gave you a shot is out and now this new coach is in and he's implementing this new system and he doesn't know you from Adam. Um, so, I mean, he's fine. I, I hope that he's one of the younger players that makes the roster at this point, because I did like him very much in those 15 games yeah. after the trade. How do you think the roster is going to look next season? And are they maybe going to start, you know, climbing up if the, if some of these prospects start playing well? I mean, they've got, there's a lot of like little weird decisions that I get hung up on that probably don't matter, mm -hmm. but you know, like Jeff Carter, the, the assumption is that he's going to move to wing. So, okay. Okay. Jeff Carter's going to move to wing. I still don't think Jeff Carter's a third line winger. I still think if you're moving him to wing, he's your second line winger, but Gabe Velarde and Martin Furk appear to be sort of tied at the hip and Furk has signed a contract extension and Velarde impressed. So you go, all right, well, do you put a line of Velarde, Furk and Carter? They're all right-handed shots. Who plays the left wing on the out? Like, I don't know who plays center. Do you put Velarde a wing? Is Carter a center? No, but they dumb little things like that. And then you have, you know, Adrian Kempe, who finally came into his own, it seems, on left wing. And he and Wagner and Lazat were a terrifically effective four-checking line. They didn't score a ton, but just as far as, like, dominating possession, they were, I don't know, one of the top ten lines in the league, just as far as denying other teams' opportunities. Um, they didn't score a ton, and I know that they want Adrian Kempe to start putting up some bigger offensive numbers, and I know that Austin Wagner sometimes plays on the fourth line. But again, Wagner's playing his off wing. He's a left winger. Kempe plays an off <laughs> left winger sometimes. Kempe is So it's like they have too many guys and not enough combinations that seem to really work. And so other than I follow Kopitar and Brown, you know, this is probably not the right way to look at it, but if I'm just sitting down with my Xbox and I'm trying to edit the lines, mm -hmm. I don't know what to do past I follow Kopitar and Brown. I don't know what the best combination of guys is. And part of that is because they have a lot of redundancies, you know, Lazat, Wagner, Moore, Lewis, and Kempe are all just sort of slightly different versions of the same guy. Martin Furk is kind of an offense only big shot, but has to, I mean, doesn't have to play with Velarde, but the two of them seem to have some chemistry. Jeff Carter, not 100% sure what, what he is or where he's going to be with his career. He just had the surgery uh, at the beginning of June, I believe it was. So who knows when or if he's coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so I this season's going to be really weird. Like I've heard people say that they could finish, you know, above 80 points and maybe contend for a playoff spot. That wouldn't stun me. But I also wouldn't be stunned if they finish with like, low 70s just because they spend the entire year trying to figure out um what they have because even the wagner lazat and kempe line which i love and is fun to watch even if they don't score a ton you have to ask yourself you know that's fine on a team that isn't winning a lot of games but <laughs> if we want to start building building something and building an identity is that the third or fourth line you want you know, carrying into the playoffs. Like, I don't know that it is as much, even though I, like I said, I like watching it. Um, so there's more, there's more questions than answers, but I, as a fan to me, that's always sort of more fun. Um, <laughs> when, when you can sort of figure that out and learn more about the game. Yeah. The Kings, I think they're going to be a great team, but we're going to have to wait one or two more years before we really see the impact of all these great prospects that they have ready to take uh, the next step, even uh, whoever they take in that second overall pick. Yeah, and I, uh, we didn't get to it, so I'll just throw it in real yeah. briefly here. Um, the goalies are another thing where it's like Jonathan Quick is, you know, certainly in the back half of his career, and, you know, he's got a bigger cap hit than Peterson by far. But even Peterson, who people have pegged as the goalie of the future, Peterson, I think, is 25. Mm -hmm. And... You know, not that 25 is over the hill or anything, but to your point about, you know, the team being really good in two or three seasons, well, then by that point, Peterson's 28. And, you know, how many goalies who are 28 or 29 suddenly become the starting goalie on a really competitive team? Meanwhile, they have all these other goalies who are like 18, 19, 20, who by the time the team is competitive <laughs> might be 23, 24, which is a more traditional tale of, you know, the goalie come along. So, 
I, it's it's gonna yeah he's uh he's 25 he'll be 26 in october so like by the time the next season starts your goalie of the future is already 26 yeah. and i'm not knocking Cal, i love watching cal peterson i hope he is the goalie of the future i hope he is great it's just another one of those things to keep an eye on um i think we frequently talk about players age in terms of their nhl careers and not in terms of their professional careers so for example you know people have listed Prokhorkin or Amadio or you know Paul Ledoux or Sean Walker or Matt Roy as some of the Kings' young prospects. And it's like these dudes are all 25 and 26. Like yeah. they're not. Or I guess Amadio is not that old. But but at some point they're not prospects anymore. They just are what they are. And yeah. the likelihood of them developing into better players diminishes. So yeah, I don't know. It's just going to be interesting. And Peterson's got he's a huge drake fan right he's got the ovo logo on the back of his mask uh that sounds right (laughs) (laughs) uh i'm like i said i'm an old man so that sort of thing (laughs) um but yeah i'm looking it up right now i mean i do like his mask um yeah i just thought i'd throw that in there for uh toronto fans because i'm pretty sure he's uh he's a bit of a drake fan so (laughs) It's good to go. All right. You can uh, find Jesse on Twitter at Kings Men Podcast. And, of course, the podcast, All the Kings Men. You can find it right on the LA Kings website when you slash podcast. And, of course, wherever you find podcasts. Jesse, thank you for coming on the show again. Thanks for having me. I love talking to Jesse about off the wall stuff, but he really knows his knowledge around the LA Kings and their prospects. It's really fabulous. Next up is Julian Mongilo. We'll get more analysis of the Kings prospects from him. Now to chat, we have Julian Mongillo. He's an LA Kings writer and scout for Dauber Prospects, and now also a Colorado Avalanche writer for The Hockey Writer. Welcome to the show, Julian. Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me. Uh, Good to be on with you here. Cool. And you can also reach him on Twitter, at Julian Mongillo. How do you spell your last name there, Julian? Uh, It's Mongillo, M-O-N-G-I-L-L-O. And you can find him on Twitter, and of course, for Dauber Prospects and the Hockey Raider. Before we get into the LA Kings and their prospects, I like to let listeners understand a little bit of our industry and people and their different roles. So what? how did you get to start becoming a scout? Uh, well, it all started. I, I've been a longtime hockey follower, sports follower, big fantasy guy, so... Uh, you know, staying up to date with all the newest guys, new up and comers, and all the all the new players coming up. It's it's important to get an edge on your on your competitors in the in the hockey fantasy hockey leagues, right? Um, so that's kind of where I, I I started following it a little bit heavier and and more in depth. Um, and then from there, my uncle actually uh, was a writer with Dover, Dover Prospects. On uh, he was a Columbus Blue Jackets writer, and he let me know they were looking for some people. Um, and I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring. And I uh, sent an email to the to the team there, and I was lucky enough to get uh, one of the L- LA uh, writer jobs there. Um, and I've been there for about two years now. Recently, just with this all COVID stuff, I've just been, uh, you know, a little bored. So mm-hmm. ended up reaching out to the hockey writers there too. Um, and they had a couple spots available, and I ended up picking up the Colorado Avalanche there. So uh, now i got two, two different teams, um, and I'm happy to, to have them both. Um, a little bit both on different ends of the spectrum of the NHL right now, obviously Mm -hmm. with Colorado doing really well and Kings in a little bit of a rebuilding stage. So it's a good mix for me to see uh, competitiveness and then rebuilders. Um, But yeah, loving it so far. But you're, as we're recording this on zoom, you're wearing a Leafs hat. How could you do the Leafs like that? (laughs) I, 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 you know what? It's hard. It's hard to do me like that, but you know what? They weren't (laughs) available or else I would have probably picked them as my team. Um, So yeah. Um, I'm a Leafs fan through and through. Been been since I was born. So, um, you know, it's uh, 
the Kings have pulled, give us a, done us a little favors lately, which is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, sending us over a couple of, of players, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a born, and, born and bred Leafs fan. During this isolation period, you told me before you've been playing a ton of golf. How busy it is is it on the golf course? Uh, golf courses are pretty pretty normal right now. Um, I guess it's it's been pretty good. The weather's been good lately, so I actually got out two days ago. Um, so on the sticks with my, some of my cousins, um, but, uh, the protocols are all in place. Um, everybody's pretty respectful. You keep your distance when you're outside. Um, so it's not too much of a hassle. And, um, as long as you just, you know, you you do your social distancing and they've done a lot with the, with the way the golf courses are set up with the holes now too. Um, so it's been good, pretty normal, uh, in terms of population though. Um, but it was good to just be able to get, um, Get get a little bit extra time here with some some time with the with the COVID to uh, to get out more often. That's good. All right, let's talk some Kings hockey. The LA Kings moved up in the draft lottery with the opportunity to draft second overall, which probably means they won't be getting Alex, being the consensus number one. Who would you pick for the Kings if you were to choose? The rumors I know are Byfield or Stutzla. Or even maybe Drysdale. Who would you pick? So I kind of gone back and forth on this a little bit. Um, m- seeing them move up, the draft really starts obviously at number two, which is where the Kings are. And um, I think that there's a there's a good group there of the three players you just mentioned. Um, Drysdale being the only defenseman, mm-hmm. but uh, I think um, they all offer different things. So Stutzel is a little bit of a more um, He's more of a he has the superstar potential, I think, um, and he he gives the he gives the, a lot of, a lot of speed. He's a six one uh, centerman. He also plays the left wing. Uh, really good skating. I think NHL Central Scouting ranked him ten out of ten on skating. Um, and Byfield's obviously a, a little bit of a bigger frame. He's a six four, very athletic type centerman, and he doesn't really often play the wing. I'm sure it could be managed to to move him over, but he's a natural centerman. Um, and, and with him, he's got great speed. He's not as agile as Stutzla. Um, but I think that he, he can protect the puck well, drives the net and, um, he's a big presence and that's kind of what you want out of a centerman, I think. Mm-hmm. And Drysdale is obviously a right-hand shot defenseman, which are hard to come by in this time of, uh, on the NHL and a lot of teams are looking for them. Um, but I think that the, the, the Kings have a lot of prospects right now on the defensive side. Um, and although they don't have many that are right-hand shot, I think that that's something that you can always acquire later on. Um, and moving down and, and passing over Byfield and Stutzla may be too much of a uh, of a stretch to do that. Um, we're seeing where they're picking. So if it was me, I think that Stutzla fits more of the of the mold that they've been drafting so far with Turcotte and and some of the other guys like Rasmus Kupari, uh, who's in the system as well. Um, and they're all smaller framed and. And, and Byfield gives them a little bit of that more physical presence. And he's still only 17 years old. He's actually turning uh, 18 in August. Mm-hmm. So I think that he gives you that, that he, he gives you that, that big frame down the middle and, and it gives the opportunity for the center in depth that they have in the organization right now to be pushed to the wing if they need to so be uh, done like that. Um, and it gives them a little bit more versatility through their lineup Um and I think that I, I, if I, if it was me picking, I'm not sure what Rob Blake would do, but it would probably be Byfield. Yeah, I'm kind of on the fence with Byfield as well. He's already almost 6'5", so young. He's probably going to grow a little bit more. He'll be a more, monster yeah. center for them. And I guess maybe even competing with Kopitar in a few years for that top line center role. Do you think Blake himself is going to go Byfield more or, or Stutzel? So if you're talking in terms of what Rob Blake would do, I know that he's mentioned before to Elliot Friedman actually on Sportsnet. Yeah. Um, he's mentioned to him that there's no, there's, it's, it's not often people would complain about having too many centermen. And when, and you're talking elite talents like Stutzla and, and Byfield to have any one of those on top of the center prospects you already have, it's never a bad thing because you can always, those prospects, if they don't end up developing the way you hoped, they're, they're always available for trade, obviously, right? And that's what you see a lot of teams doing now, moving those picks to get players that can help them now, right? So building a prospect pool with elite-level talent, um, it's almost it's almost toward the point where you're taking the best available um, just either to use them for yourself or to use them as an asset to to recoup something that you'd want later. 
-hmm. So for me, I think, I think Byfield would be the guy because he doesn't fit what they already have. So if he doesn't pan out, then they can always go the trade route with that too. The Kings have a really good prospect pool. Of course, consensus maybe is probably number one in North America there in the league. Um, with the strong list with Turcotte, Kaliev, Velarde, which of those guys has probably the best chance to be a top line impact player in their career? That's a good question. Um, I think that they do have a lot of really good, really good top end talent there. I would, I would rank them as number one in prospect pools across the league. Um, I, I would say Velarde would have the best chance. He's been battling injuries for a long time, chronic back injuries for, for the better part of two years now, almost. Um, and I think he does have that superstar upside still where he can contribute at a high level. Um, you saw that a little bit last season when he was with the Kings for, for the near end of the, the tail end of the season there. Um, and I think that he does have that ability, but the injuries are the, obviously the part that scares everybody. So, uh, he would be my number one pick, but because of those injuries, I think I would say Kaliev does have the, the elite level superstar scoring ability. Um, he's a great goal scorer. He's got a raw talent for, for putting the puck in the net and that's hard to find too. Um, he kind of reminds me of like a Tarasenko type player. Um, uh, very dynamic, uh, likes to shoot off the wing. Uh, he's a potent goal scorer and those are hard to find. He's a legit top line impact player. Uh, he does need to work on his, um, his defensive play, but when you're getting guys like that, they, you know, they're, they're a little bit one dimensional, but he's an elite level talent. And if he can, if he can tap into his work ethic, uh, and competitive edge, I think that he has the, the chance to be an elite level superstar goal scorer in the NHL. Who do you think is ready for the Kings, maybe out of the prospects, to jump into the team starting whenever next season starts? Yeah, right now, um, I think they, they're they looking a little thin on defense right now. They have Ben Hutton, who's an unrestricted free agent, and as well as uh, Joaquin Ryan. They're both UFA, so uh, that leaves about five players under contract right now is, uh, in the NHL level uh, in terms of defensemen. So there will be a couple spots available, I think, to give to – uh, players in the AHL. Um, I think that Mikey Anderson, he came up last year um, and he he played about six games for them. He scored his first NHL goal. Um, he's one that I would say is pretty much ready to jump into the lineup. Uh, projects to be more of a second or third pairing defenseman, but he, he can give you minutes in, in any situation. Uh, he's a natural leader, a uh, great guy to have on your blue line to eat up minutes at any point in the game. Um, so I think he'll be uh, he'll be with the Kings this season full time. Another guy they saw we saw a lot of uh, not a lot of but um, they they used last year was Tob Tobias Bjornfort. Uh, he was the uh, 22nd overall pick in the draft when they traded for Muzzin. Um, he was part of the package that they got back, and he's a good two-way defenseman. He's when he's played with the Kings early in the in the season last year, he was paired with Drew Doughty. So. Um, he's that guy who's more of a stable presence on the back end. Um, and he'll be a, more of a stay at home, uh, safety net for an elite level, uh, partner, uh, on the blue line. Um, so he, he will have a chance definitely to crack the lineup as well. And Kale Clegg's Kale Clegg is another one who's been, um, with the rain for a better part of two years. Now he had 25 points in 49 games last year with the rain and it was an AHL all-star with them. Um, he's another guy that I think will be given the opportunity to finally make the jump to, um, to the NHL. And then obviously Velarde should be there. Um, I would put him more as a second line center this year behind Anze Kopitar. Uh, Blake Lazat featured there last year, who was another prospect in the Kings, uh, pool. Um, but he might, I would, I would say he, if, if Velarde's healthy and ready to go, he'll probably bump Lazat down. Um, and then Samuel Fajemo, uh, he's another one who's a, a Swedish winger, um, did really well in the world junior championships um and the, the kings don't have a lot of right wing depth right now so he might have an easy path to some playing time on the right side there and he's a pretty good goal scorer and um he looks to be nhl ready as well yeah this upcoming season for the kings looks like it's going to be a pretty interesting one and the future looks very exciting for the kings we're probably going to get you on the show further on in the season maybe talk about Colorado as well. Thank you for coming on the show, Julian. All right. Thanks for having me. And yeah, anytime we can uh, chat hockey, I'm here. Just uh, give me a shout and uh, we'll get it. We'll get it done.
It was good chatting with Julian. He knows the prospects really well with the Kings. And of course, if you go on our game notes for our episode page, we'll have all our guests on the show. And of course, Julian's recent blog for Dauber Prospects, more analysis of them. I hope you enjoyed our LA Kings draft lottery and prospect show, everyone. That's it for this episode for Jablam Sports Hockey. Go to jablamsports.com to see all our podcasts and even game notes for each episode. Again, you'll get info and links to all the things we mentioned in the show. Please subscribe and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or anywhere you get podcasts. Click on the three dots in your podcasting app and share this episode with three friends. You can follow me on Twitter at Russian98, R-U-S-S-I-A-N-98, or the entire team at Jablam Sports. Also, if you like wrestling, go check out our new wrestling podcast, Pro Wrestling Explode, brought to you by our team at Jablam Sports. It's where Joey Pepperoni and I get into AEW and WWE. We recap, analyze recent matches, storylines, and pay-per-views, and what's in wrestling news. If you have any comments on the show, again, you can... Check us out on our website, go to our contact page, or you can go on Twitter and hashtag us. Use the hashtag Jablam Sports, J-B-L-A-M Sports. Thank you, everyone. Today's shout-out is for Paul Zwembeck. I just want to thank him for always helping me, especially the first few years. He was hardcore in assembling everything for Jablam Sports Hockey, starting it and working together with me. He's been a great supporter of the show and team, and he's always a great guy that I can talk to. I hope you enjoy enjoy being a great father, Paul. To everyone out there, I'm giving you a virtual hug. Stay healthy.